Sheriff Show. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Bryant on sound effects, a spirited round of the Rotten Tomatoes game, and Adam Carolla is unprepared. And now, bringing comedy gold to gold, Adam Carolla! Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Uh, thanks for giving uh, Sonny a cheer. <laughs> Unearned praise is his middle name. <laughs> He's back there looking at bison burgers, feeling good about himself. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, you guys, for uh, coming out tonight. Do appreciate it. As per usual, uh, before we get started with the show, I made a couple of notes on one of my buck slips. Some... Uh, some thoughts about your town and about uh, my travels. I <laughs> uh, took a walk down the street, went to the Starbucks. Very diverse community you guys have here. <laughs> Apparently there's Irish and Scottish folks <laughs> here tonight. Haven't seen this many white people since Beck played Sturgis. <laughs> be a white crowd, yeah. Uh, I was, uh, so happy Juneteenth, everybody. Uh, I was listening uh, to the radio in Los Angeles yesterday, and they were talking about this poor guy at the Masterpiece Cake Shop out here in, outside of Denver. Jack Phillips, poor guy, tries to... All right, but here's my thought. So you guys know the case. Gay couple comes in, and they go, we want a wedding cake. And he's like, well, I'm very religious, so you can buy a cake like off the cake rack or you can have another cake, but I cannot bake you a gay wedding cake. And then they were like, you must bake us a gay wedding cake or we're going to sue your ass. I know it sounds gayer when gay guys go, we're going to sue your ass. That was some of the worst ass I've ever had. Larry versus this guy's ass. The court is in session. But uh, they ended up suing him because he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't bake him a cake. Um, but then I was thinking about it. I, like, I think I know a fair amount about the gay culture and lifestyle. And I'm pretty sure they just did this so they could bring this guy to court because I'm pretty sure they could have baked their own cake because <laughs> what are the chances two gay guys and one of them isn't a baker? Please. I don't think so. Now, you get a couple of dykes, you ain't gonna get Toll House cookies out of those bitches. But two gay guys and one of them's not a master baker? I don't think so. Then he won that case. Then it went back because another couple wanted him to bake them a transition cake. Their kid was transitioning and they wanted, remember when you were a kid all those transition parties used to go to? <laughs> the best part of my childhood was the bar mitzvahs and the transition parties. Uh, I don't know how, I don't even know what a transition cake looks like. I imagine it starts off as a pie. I just made this shit up on the ride over. It's not that worked out. I got off the plane. One of my least favorite things happened to me. I got off the plane in uh, Denver couple hours ago. Uh, it was hot. Like the, for some reason, the jetway, the jetway is always more of whatever's bad outside. So if you're in Newark and it's February and it's 21 degrees outside, it's nine degrees in the jetway. 
And if you're in Florida and it's 114, it's 127. And I, if they've not figured out a way to cool or heat, there's a giant airport that is perpetually 71 degrees, and then there's a giant airplane that's 71 degrees. But the tube that goes from the airport to the plane, we're just going to fucking roll the dice. Whatever nature blows in, that's what it's going to be. We cannot control this one space. We can control all other spaces in the universe, but we have no dominion over this plank that goes to the airplane. Impossible to figure out a way to heat or cool that. So then I got off the plane and I walked into the bakery tube that was uh, going in the airport and I was like, oh man, it's hot. I've never... I've never been to Denver when it's this hot. And then some asshole local goes, oh, it gets hotter. Okay, thank you for the shaming. You're much more seasoned than I am. I do imagine this is not the hottest day on record in Denver history, but I'm still allowed to pontificate out loud without being judged. Then uh, here's a, uh, here's a, a, a little... Uh, snippet, a little tidbit. We were uh, driving out of the airport, and when we saw the uh, giant Bronco, the big, uh, the big blue Bronco, and the big blue Bronco, and then uh, my son looked at it, and he said, here's a fun fact. The guy who sculpted it was crushed by it while he was sculpting it. And you know what they do. They go, well, he died doing what he loved. <laughs> but I don't know. How much do you love it at the time? You know what I mean? When you're caught between the jowls of a Bronco on the floor of your studio bleeding out, do you really love sculpting at that point? Like, if I gave you a choice at that point, of sculpting versus working at a mail sorting facility where you get to see your 80th birthday. What do you think that guy would have chose? Anyway, life goes on and uh, the statue is up there. 32 feet, uh, according to, uh, to my son. Uh, I eyeballed it. It looked short. I'm going to throw a tape on it when we get back to the airport. But that's just the, that's just the carpenter in me. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, Red Rocks. Yeah. We're going to Red Rock. We're going there tomorrow. Uh, and if any, you guys go to Red Rocks? Uh, I like Red Rocks. It's, it's uh, beautiful. The, the hiking trails are beautiful. The, the venue is beautiful. They, I guess it's an amphitheater. It's beautiful. Don't really need the assholes exercising. <laughs> Skinny bitches with their Fitbits like going up the fucking stairs. It's, I'm so much better than you. You came here to get high and criticize the government, but I'm fucking working my core. Fuck those people. Exercise. Uh, you know they got a set of stairs somewhere around their shitty apartment, but they, they can't be seen by all there. Oh, we, we can't marvel at their intestinal fortitude. Always people exercising at that place. And then I was like, uh, what band is playing there this, this weekend? And the last time... I played Denver, we went to Red Rocks, and I said, what band is playing here? And the band is called Lettuce. And I'm like, how fucking old am I? I've, I've never heard of a band called Lettuce, but they're Lettuce. By the way, I don't know why, but if you've never heard of a band, and someone goes, I don't know what that band is, all you have to do is say, they're a jam band. And then everyone goes, oh, okay, I got you. I don't know why that means we shouldn't have heard of them, but they're a jam band. And I said, who's playing this weekend? Wrote that down. Umphreys um McGee is playing this jam band. Never heard of them? Jam band. Oh, okay. 
That's probably how they get booked at Red Rocks. Like they go to the booker, they go to the promoter and go, we'd like to play Red Rocks. I've never heard, we're jam band. Oh, okay, Saturday. I hear somewhere, I found out they're a jam band because uh, one of the bartender's roommates says uh, he's gonna get a handful of mushrooms and go out there <laughs> for nine hours. I feel like the number one job for roommates is bartender, right? <laughs> Not a lot of guys flying solo bartending. I, um, I was sitting in the bar, actually, in, uh, at Burbank today. We left out of the Burbank airport, sitting in the Burbank bar. And uh, I sent this text to uh, Jimmy Kimmel. I said, uh, you know, he got a bowl game named after him. They literally named a bowl game after him. And, you know, he's hosted the Oscars and the Emmys and, you know, had, you know, uh, fair to moderate success in Hollywood. <laughs> but having a bowl game named after you is the greatest thing in the world. And so I just texted him and said, uh, you beat Colbert, Colbert in, the, in the ratings last week, and uh, now you got a bowl game named after you, so you know, you're on quite a roll, buddy. And he texted back 10 seconds later, and he's like, oh my God, I'm in Vegas right now telling the story of when you met Jerry Lewis in Aspen. Now here's how low my self-esteem is. <laughs> I have zero recollection of ever meeting Jerry Lewis. I am a comedian. Jerry Lewis is one of the most iconic comedic figures of the last hundred years. I met Jerry Lewis. He talked to me, and I have zero recollection of it. I do remember the name of every chick who didn't want to go to the prom with me when I was 17. That's locked away. The great Jerry Lewis and our exchange in Aspen, Colorado, zero recollection, but uh, thankfully I was sitting with uh, Mike August at the table. And, and Mike goes, oh yeah, you met Jerry Lewis in, in Aspen. And I said, what'd he say? And Mike said it, and I wrote it down because Jimmy just wrote it to me. We ran into Jerry Lewis, must have been at the Aspen Comedy Festival, pff, circa 1999. He, the great Jerry Lewis, had no goddamn idea who Jimmy was, but he did know who I was. And he said, quote, oh, I know you, Adam. You're the guy who talks dirty at night. That is the legacy of the great Jerry Lewis. Quick break. Let me tell you about our friends over at Tommy John this summer. Oh, man, you're going to soak up the sun, but don't soak up the sweat. That's where Tommy John comes in. Cool cotton fabric, two to three times cooler than regular cotton. Get a pair of new Tommy John underwear and let your buns breathe for a change. Dozens of comfort innovations like breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric, Four times the stretch of competing brands. Once you try Tommy John underwear, you're never going back to your current underwear. I'm telling you, once you switch, you'll be a fan. Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. I'm wearing mine right now, especially during the summer months. The best. Over 15 million pairs sold. Tens of thousands of five-star reviews. It is the best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free, guarantee. Right, Dawson? Right now, get 20% off your first order at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. Go to TommyJohn.com slash Adam for 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. All right, should we uh, bring uh, Bald Brian and Gina Grad into the fray? <laughs> you guys up and running? Hey, man. Looking hey, hey, good. Hey, hey, hey. hey. All right, we got the, um, and I'll, I'll ask you guys any, any Colorado thoughts or Denver thoughts or Golden thoughts. Uh, and we We're got, not there, Adam. Oh, you're not here? <laughs> no, oh, not there. I thought he said Starbucks. We got a, um, 
we we got the Rotten Tomatoes game to uh, play as well. It, it's 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 picturesque out here. It is well, it is beautiful. I can only imagine. Yeah, it would have to be. If you're called Golden, there's nowhere to go but down. You got a reputation up for Yeah. Yeah, but you guys are doing it right because Golden, Colorado is is aptly named versus the shithole known as Hawaiian Gardens, where where we come from. So, you guys are keeping it legit over here. Right, right on the corner of Victory Boulevard. Oh yeah. Also on the corner, also on the corner of Rape and Murder. I know. <laughs> Yeah, it is funny. I've never really thought uh, about... There, there's a street in North Hollywood where I grew up called Victory Boulevard, and there's nothing but losers on Victory <laughs> Boulevard. Nothing victorious. <laughs> yeah, it is, it, is, uh, it, it is a complete shit show. It's not like Tom Landry said, I'm moving to Victory Boulevard <laughs> so I can be with Vince Lombardi. That's a deep coaching cut. I, I get it. How, how's Denver going to... How are the Broncos going to be this year? Are they, well, they going to be bad? Who you, are you going to get Aaron Rodgers? Uh, they'll do it. Um, and then you got... Uh, God, what's your standout outside backer's name? Von Miller. I, I can I, I always screw it up because it's it's uh, he he doesn't look like a Von Miller, but you do know we were talking about him getting a tattoo of his uh, unborn girl's name on his arm and then changing it at some point to another name. I don't know my my feeling with uh, my feeling with tattoos is there's few few too many of them floating around out there. I I like. Well, here's the, here's the thing. Like, a tattoo used to mean something. Like, you'd go, you'd see a tattoo and you'd go, oh, that guy was a Marine. Or that guy's a longshoreman. Or she's a whore. <laughs> <laughs> you knew shit. Now it's just, oh, I get it. You're a douchebag. Everyone's got a tattoo. Everybody's got a tattoo. All right, should we play uh, Dawson? Are you there? Yeah. Right here. All right. You want to, uh, you want to play the uh, Rotten Tomatoes game? Woo! Let's do it. Listen to that. After a bizarre learn-from-home school year, campuses are still staying closed for the summer. Those kids need a break, goddammit. And take it from Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC. Those kids really want to go to summer camp. Oh, can I? uh, Yeah, I don't think she's had her kid vaccinated. But, uh, sorry Dawson, but everything reminds me of something. I was uh, listening to the radio on the ride into the uh, studio today, and they did a vote of uh, L.A. City school teachers to see which ones of them were willing to return to work in August after two goddamn years of (laughs) masturbating in front of their computers. Some did in the shower. Some, right. And... It was like a vote of like 8,000 said yes and 700 said no, even though everything is wide open, everyone's been vaccinated, the masks are coming down, the gloves are coming off, the Purell's going into the garbage, and there's still 700 teachers in L.A. County who are like, no, I vote not to return to my place of work to mold youth. If I was in charge, I would simply run down the 700 people that voted against going back to their job and just go, 
obviously you have no goddamn interest in your work. I'm shit canning your ass. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, wait till I'm in charge. Sorry, all Dawson. Right. That's all right. Well, whether or not you've gotten your vaccination, you can certainly play along with this week's Rotten Tomatoes game. It's all about summer camp movies. We'll begin with a movie that's noted for being Bill Murray's first starring role, and also the film that launched the directing career of Ivan Reitman. Murray stars as a prank-pulling, girl-seducing, fun-loving head counselor who's sick and tired of losing the Camp Olympics every year to the rich kids' camp across the lake. But maybe, just maybe, this summer will be different. From 1979, Meatballs. Meatballs. Is this the, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's, it's overrated as a comedy, is it not? It's pretty terrible. We'll it's, find it's, out. it's bereft of laughs. All right. It's overrated. What is, which movie is funnier, Spaceballs or Meatballs? Oh, how dare you? Spaceballs by a mile. All right, Spaceballs. I, but so I feel like Meatballs, even though we thought it's not really funny, got a little overhyped or something? Or maybe it's is all... There, hmm. Because this, like, I feel like these movies came out close together and I think one's a little more racist than the other. Maybe a little anti-Semitic. Are Meatballs and Porky's the same thing? No, no. Porky's, Porky's is super anti-Semitic and violent and weird. That's with one this is more hijinks. I see. Yeah, this is more hijinks. All right. Uh, I say the critics didn't love it. They barely liked it. I got it at 53. Oh, a little lower. 41. 49. Meatballs is fresh oh, no. at 72%. Oh. I told you. Not with the people. Over hype. Our next film stars Shelley Long as a Beverly Hills housewife who copes with her upcoming divorce by leading a local troop of wilderness girls. Of course, taking charge of all those sassy Girl Scouts has its setbacks, but wouldn't you know it, spending all that time with kids makes you a better person. Co-starring Craig T. Nelson and very young actresses Carla Cugino and Jenny Lewis, from 1989, Troop Beverly Hills. I'm sorry, do I get to do my Troop Beverly Hills monologue twice in one week? Yes. He put the space in Sphinx's teeth. He knocked the hat off Hagler's head. He's the one, he's the only. My dad, James the Jackhammer, Shakar. Now, Daddy, shake the man's hand and let's be on our way. Uh, <laughs> I just feel like we need to tell the uh, partisan Colton crowd, that's what black people sound like. <laughs> if you ever hear, I know you've not spoken to any, but when you hear them, like on the radio or after, uh, during a locker room interview, that's essentially Gina's doing what they sound like. I was just imitating the girl, but yeah, sure. All right. This can't be good. How dare you? It can't. It can't have gotten a good review, but, you know, it was likable. I will say 37. This is a pleasant enough movie that I can't imagine the critics were nice to it. I said 48. You guys are motherfuckers. This movie is amazing. It has the big song, It's Cookie Time, at the end. Big dance number. Very hard for me to judge this uh, impartially. Nora Ephron movie, I believe, which I think gives it a bump. Mm. 62, just barely fresh. Mm. Troop Beverly Hills is rotten at 25%. This is a travesty. Travesty! It's a pleasant it's fantastic. It's cookie time. It's cookie time. It's cookie time. You guys should be rooting for me because if I win, I pledge to victory to all the homeless. Go ahead. All right. After the Eddie Murphy film, Daddy Daycare raked in $164 million on a budget of only $60 million. It was obvious to money-grubbing producers that a sequel was absolutely necessary. 
But after shifting the action to a rundown summer camp, two unique changes were made. First, the star of the film would now be Cuba Gooding Jr. And second, the director would now be Wonder Years actor Fred Savage in his feature film directorial debut. Find out if the combo worked. In 2007's Daddy Day Camp. Wow. Never. He directed many good episodes of It's Always Sunny. That's true. A red herring, Brian. Never, never even heard of this. I think anyone is much money. All right. This is, uh, it's got to be low, right? Now look, there's such a thing as a, as a zero out there. Brian, Brian will we'll flip the zero card on occasion. He's been right more than once. I've hit the zero a couple times. That's right. Uh, Cuba is uh, he's charismatic and, and likable. And for that reason, I'm going to give it a 11. Zero! Zero. I, too, gave it an 11. Mm. Daddy Day Camp is rotten at one. Oh! Oh! <laughs> is that mathematically possible? That's almost more shaming than a zero. That critic needs a windbreaker <laughs> with that on the back of it. That he is the only critic in America who gave a thumbs up to Daddy Day Camp. So when they have the critic conventions, he can proudly walk around with his windbreaker and people will be talking, you know, it's the one guy who gave hey, Daddy the Daycare. Hey, there he is. He's the one critic who gave Daddy Daycare a thumbs up. All right, well, we got a, we got a close-ish game here as we uh, head into the championship rounds. Well, it's not all s'mores and sunshine at Camp Crystal Lake. You see, there was a tragedy there many years ago where a little boy drowned. And ever since then, sex-loving camp counselors have been getting brutally murdered in spectacularly graphic ways. While Jason Voorhees would go on to terrorize teens for another three decades, shockingly, he barely appears in the first film, featuring a relatively unknown Kevin Bacon from 1980, Friday the 13th. Mmm... This is the this is the first one. Yeah. Because no pun intended, but this has that camp factor that I think people like, critics like. Yeah. All right. This is this is tough because these they're schlocky, but they can yeah. still get a, a decent score. All right. This could be mid thirties. It could be mid seventies. We don't know. I feel like I'm clinging on to a very marginal lead, and I can feel it slipping through my fingers. I am not going up to the 70s. I think that's, I think that's too high. That's too grandiose. I'm going to say 41. I may have gone too high at 55. Then I definitely went too high at 60. Friday the 13th is fresh. Oh! At 64%. Oh! Ooh. Wow. And finally, move over Indiana Jones. You want a real franchise? Look no further than the late, great Jim Varney. <laughs> over the course of ten, that's right, ten films, he went to jail, he went to school, he went to Africa, he saved Christmas, and let's not forget the time he, he's, he was scared stupid, whatever the fuck that means. But in 1987, in what was the, it was only the second Ernest movie, Ernest Goes to Camp. Mm. I think one of these is fresh. Um, you remember so, Hey Vern guy? Yeah, yeah that's Jim Varney. Um, we may or may not have his autobiography in my house, and uh, one of us is a big fan of Ernest Saves Christmas. All right, well, I feel like I had a lead. I lost the lead. 
I've got to get it back here. It's going to be low. But is it single digit low? Is it double digit low? We've seen ones today already. Brian may pull, Brian may go for that zero card again. It's on the table for sure. I'm going to go for seven. Yay! Oh, and Andre John Elway also went seven. I went four. Well, Ernest goes to camp. Is fresh. <laughs> oh! It's <laughs> 62%. Oh! You guys see his last one, Ernest Goes to the Mausoleum? Holy shit. Oh, my God. Uh, well, no, no one gained anything. <laughs> no. Well. Wow. For the first time in a long time, yeah. we have a tie. Oh. Holy wow. Wow. And that tie is for first place. Remember, I'm playing for the homeless. Let me just say, Gina Grad, congratulations, you made the podium third place. You will not be playing in this playoff. Here we go. For the tiebreaker. You know, fat kids gotta go to camp too. And a bunch of them team up against an authoritarian camp owner who's determined to exploit them for a fat camp infomercial. Written by Judd Apatow, starring Ben Stiller from 1995. Heavyweights. Is this, uh, sorry, are Brian and I tied? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Oh, uh, they never had a hot dog they didn't like until now. All right. Uh, this is kind of before fat shaming. And, and we, did we say Ben Stiller or Judd Apatow? Who wrote Both. this? Yes. Both. Right, those guys are funny guys. And but as you usually say, another great excuse for Ben Stiller to take his shirt off. Mm, did he? Yeah, isn't he like a, like a mean camp yeah, he, counselor? He's actually like similar to how he was in Dodgeball. Like he's like a fitness, you know, kind of obsessed. All right. I have no idea... But I think critics like fat kids because they all were fat kids. <laughs> and I think it's got a good writing staff. So I'm going to say Barely Fresh at 61. Oh, shit. Barely Fresh at 63. What'd well, you put? 63. 53. 6'3. Six, three. Six, three. Oh, 63. Woo! And yeah, two points separate. Both of your calls. Please be 62. So, if this movie is fresh, Brian will win. If the movie is rotten, the game goes to the ace man. And the homeless, and the millions of homeless around the world. (laughs) Heavyweights is rotten. Yeah! At 29%. Oh! And homeless. Man. It's going to be a good weekend, yo. Of course, this is usually the time Brian reminds everyone if he didn't win that this is just an exhibition. It's unofficial, yeah. Non-sanctioned game. Yeah. Quick. All right. Uh, Gina, you got the news ready? And we'll do, the, we'll do the news, and then we'll bring up uh, Steve, our uh, NASA rocket scientist, and bring him up here. And uh, it'll be fun fun watching a rocket science not be able to spin around the ball hopper correctly because it never works but we'll do that. Should we get into some news Gina Grad? Let's do it. Give me the news with Grad News with Gina Grad Breaking viral Weird crime protest politics Give me news with Gina Grad Stuff they saw on TMZ Joe Biden Coming out Meet news with Gina Gina Grad The news with Gina Grad. Well, this headline.
line making the rounds, Olympic runner Shelby Houlihan said she's been banned from the sport for four years following a positive test for anabolic steroids, but she says it, uh, it's a false positive and she got it from eating a pork burrito. <laughs> Houlihan said she was devastated to learn of the suspension from the Athletics Integrity Unit, which is an independent body that combats doping after she tested positive for nandrolone. I don't know uh, yeah. if anyone uses, does she eat the pork burrito as a euphemism for... <laughs> Can you get a blowjob? But right. we should hop on that. I know, right? You met a new gal. She's got a college education. She's came. Yeah, but does she eat the pork burrito? <laughs> but she was actually eating a pork burrito. I saw this story on TMZ because we feed pork or pig so much of these steroids that it is thought oh, that. Uh, yeah. Oh, like the steroids yes. that were in the pork. And she's, but, but first off, she's an Olympic caliber athlete and she's eating off a burrito truck. I mean, <laughs> should she really be representing America with this sort of fast and loose approach to diet heading into one of the most crucial Olympics of this podcaster's life? Okay, that's right. I didn't know you cared so much about the Olympics. Oh, yes. Yeah, apparently this can happen. Uh, a study found, founded by WADA, that's World Anti-Doping Agency, found trace amounts of nandrolone that can be found in meat and warned about the possibility of a false positive. I mean, if, if Elaine on Seinfeld can get a, you know, everyone thinks she's on heroin because she had a poppy seed bagel. This is in the zeitgeist. This happens. Do, is there any job... Or activity where a woman looks more miserable than long distance running. I have never seen a woman look happy running any distance. They always have that pained look of grip. They're always like, oh, fuck, I hate my husband so much. God, do I hate my stepdaughter. Oh, do I hate my family. Oh. Oh, I hate my ex-husband, I hate my current husband, I hate my goddaughter, I hate my biological daughter, I hate my job, I hate that bakery I just passed, I hate that dog, I hate the drinking fountain, I hate that candle store. Oh, I'm so miserable. The only way I can spread misery effectively is if I go out and circumnavigate the globe with this look that looks like someone put a plate of shit under my face while I run the whole time and go, oh. Oh, I'm so miserable. If you hate jogging so much, bitches, then knock it off. <laughs> or get a fucking elliptical and stay home. Don't spread your anger all over the globe. They do it. And by the way, they don't do it in remote parts of the country. They come right to your front door. Oh, look how miserable I am. Are you miserable? I wasn't. You're going to be. Look at this. Look at me. Oh. Oh, I hate these Nikes. Oh, oh, I'm going to go take a shit at a high school. Oh, I'm so miserable. I just want to make sure we're clear. You want the basically the entire sport to be banned because you don't like the face. Or paint a goddamn smile on your face. I see. Guys who play hockey look like they're having a much better time than chicks who are running. You want to know the happiest campers in the world? I love passing these guys. Guy on recumbent bike. <laughs> that guy, he doesn't have a fucking care in the world. Oh, he made the, he fucking brazed the welds himself in the garage. That's his own thing. He's, uh, he's got, and, and this guy, the recumbent bike guy, he's got a lot of range because he's like, I like exercising. But I also like reclining. Yeah. Hmm. How can I mix my two favorite activities? I like to recline, but I also enjoy burning calories and spreading goodwill. Oh, are these guys happy? They got the helmet on. They got the little mirror. They got the little rear view. The little flag. They got the flag. They got the marker flag. Hey, everybody, here I come. Here comes the happy. Check the flag. Woo! Recumbent bike guy. 
And this guy is also Lone Wolf McRae. Because the guys on the 10-speed, that's always a gaggle. There's always 14 of those guys. They're all together. Hey, where's Ron? Did we miss him at the signal? Wait for Ron. Recumbent bike, that guy flies solo. He's alone. He cannot find one other recumbent bike guy within a 20-mile radius of him. That's why they can never... There's never a pack of recumbent bike guys because there's (laughs) one every 7,000 acres. There's never more than one recumbent guy. Yes, Brian? No, you're right. They they travel alone. They travel alone. alone. There's a story. You know they got stories, those recumbent bike guys. Oh, they used to be upright guys. Not anymore. (laughs) No, but those guys are happy. And those guys are spreading the joy by the mile. And then here comes the miserable bitch. And she's going to run next door to recumbent bike guy. And now they're having a face-off. Literally, a face-off. Because recumbent bike guy is full of happy, mirthy thoughts. And then super angry jogging bitch is in a duel to the death with the stink eye. Sorry. <laughs> what about that chick? Uh, pork burrito. Pork no burrito. No more, no more running. By the way, um, I just realized, you know who it will, we'll call it a sport just for the sake of conversation. The angriest celebrator in sports, mm. the bowler. Mm. He rolls a turkey and he looks angry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think... I think we made a mistake. We made a mistake with bowling when we kind of let it turn into a sport, you know? <laughs> used to be, you know, it used to be in the 70s, the guys are wearing Sansevelt slacks and, you know, golfing shoes or a bowl. They're wearing the bowling shoes, but they got like the gabardine slacks on and the announcers are like, okay, here comes uh, John McDougal. He's stepping up. Okay, he's getting ready to go now. He's just put down a cigarette. He's <laughs> handed one, one of the, he's one the scores his beer, and it looks like he's ready to go here. Here we go. Like, it used to be that kind of sport, and now these guys are kind of, eh, they're like golfers. They're kind of turned into athletes or something. I don't like it. Well, a Florida woman is under arrest for attacking her girlfriend because she heard her talking about an ex in her sleep. Mm. 23-year-old Alexis Talley shares an apartment with her 21-year-old girlfriend. The victim told police she woke up to Talley yelling at her and punching her in the face over and over again because she was apparently talking about her former lover in her sleep. Talley admitted to getting angry about hearing her muttering the ex's name, but she claimed she only yelled in her face, didn't punch her. Those two haven't eaten a pork burrito in a fortnight. I guarantee you that. You know what? I don't encourage domestic violence. Uh, but stop here. Things should stop. If you ever feel like punching a spouse or a significant other, just tell them they were talking about their ex in their sleep. They have, they have no way to disprove that. If I woke up and I was being punched, and it was because I talked about my ex in my sleep, I wouldn't go, I definitely was not. I'd just be disoriented and probably apologize. It's like the people who get defensive about snoring. Right. Yeah, that's... You that's, love that guy. Oh, I love the guy. I love it. I, I've shared, I've shared a, a bed with uh, many, many a man. <laughs> I did. I... I, I j- j- Jimmy and I would, would sleep in the same bed all the time because we, we'd travel and the radio station would pay for it and it would just get us one room, you know? And Off a lot of pork burritos. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and Jimmy would snore and then I'd wake him up in the middle of the night and I'd go, you're snoring. And then he'd go, I don't snore. <laughs> and then I would go, okay, well, I'm just the worst person in the world because my plan is I wait for people to fall asleep silently. I wait till about 4.15 in the a.m. and then I wake them and accuse them of something they weren't doing. That makes me a maniac. You understand? 
And could argue that would cut into my sleep time as well. Really, really nothing in it for me. All right, sorry, where were we? So the uh, two lesbians got into a fight because yeah. she was talking about, talking her, about ex. her ex. Cops noted some visible swelling on the woman who uh, uh, was punched and arrested Tally for domestic battery. Mm-hmm. You've come a long way, babies. Uh, that's right. Well, it's like you said. I mean, we're seeing more uh, examples every day that we are not the fairer sex. We are the more violent sex. Well, women are definitely more violent than men, but we used to have a society that frowned on women beating each other up, and now a bunch of guys just get in a half circle and start masturbating. So I think we're we're kind of sending the wrong message to the ladies, you know? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about a guy on the other side of the spectrum, a very busy man indeed, a man in India recently died at the age of 76. He left behind 38 wives, 89 children, and 36 grandchildren. Uh, you're clapping for that? He was believed to have the largest family in the world. He died of complications from diabetes and hypertension. He was said to be the leader of a religious sect uh, which practices polygamy. All of his wives and children even lived together in a four-story house. Uh, he, of course, had his private room. Nobody let me, let me yeah. say this about religious sex, <laughs> uh, uh, a.k.a. cults. Right. <laughs> they always, they start off with, hey, let me play a little Cat Stevens on the acoustic guitar, <laughs> and they always end up with, I need to bang your daughters, right? <laughs> they always end up with the one dude getting his pork burrito <laughs> noshed on by everyone in the cult, right? There's never a cult that, whose, whose end game is recycling. <laughs> They've never heard of it. There's never a cult that just ends up in, uh, well, what do you guys end up doing? Oh, we, we, we remove graffiti. <laughs> yeah. It's just me and a bunch of these chicks and their hot daughters, but we pretty much just remove graffiti and then we call it a day. And then we all go our separate ways. It always involves... I, and I'm trying to think... In women, well, first things first. Then how come women never start cults? Because the only reason you start a cult is to get laid. And women aren't wired like men, so they don't do that. But you women, now that you're having fist fights at the airport may want to think of throwing your hat in the ring and doing all things male now. Start a cult. Now, you I don't... What? B- what? Oh, sorry. I was just thinking, you know what women are notoriously good at in the cult? Grooming other women to sure. have sex with the leader. Right, right. That's yeah. where we shine. Yeah, you women need to start a cult, although... That would never work because you can't get a whole bunch of chicks in the same room together without them hating each other's guts. <laughs> they hate each other. I, I don't know. What is the percentage of women who don't have any female friends versus men who don't have any male friends? I think it's a thousand to one. Sorry, women. You're just not as good as we are. But you live longer, and you get a break on your insurance, so it kind of comes out in the wash. Sorry, Gina, where were we? Well, let's talk about another cult, a different kind of cult, the Girl Scouts. While the pandemic caused all sorts of production problems and shortages, it had the opposite effect on Girl Scout cookies. The Girl Scouts of America says it has a surplus of 15 million boxes of unsold cookies due in large part to the pandemic, even though they were doing the drive-by stuff and the drive-through and the online sales. It wasn't enough. That surplus is supposed to be worth $60 million. I bet the they're all, are they all trefoils? The they're stupid all the gluten-free white shit. cookie? Yeah. Ugh. The Girl Scouts typically sell about 200 million boxes each year. They're looking into donating these unsold boxes to food banks. So get thee to a food Wait, bank. Let me, uh, let me ask this. Um, Everyone, everyone, you know, you hear people going, uh, hey, what's going on with Black Lives Matter? It's like, where's all the money going? Where's all the money going? Where the fuck is all the money going with Girl Scout cookies? Someone's got to... John Stossel's got to get to the bottom of this shit. 
that I feel like they raise $200 billion every year in cookie sales. I don't pass any big buildings that have Girl Scouts written on it. I don't see any bridges. This bridge, yeah, this bridge donated by the Girl Scouts. Yeah, where, where is all the Girl Scout money? Where's the cookie money heading? Like, where is it supposed to go? They're getting sophisticated, too. Like, uh, Christy and I were out for a walk during COVID in our neighborhood, and there was a, a house dead down the street that, like, had a QR code on a sign and said, oh, order your girls got cookies here, touchless. Like, they're doing, like, QR codes and shit. And, and what I noticed uh, when I used to work over at uh, Jimmy Kimmel Live with the writers over there, what's, what's happened is Girl Scouts, when I grew up, Girl Scouts sold Girl Scout cookies. They basically stood in front of the supermarket on Saturday, waited for people to come out. They sold their Girl Scout cookies that way. Now, Girl Scouts have their bitch dads mule them into work. They literally, they, they fucking turn out their dads and they get their dads to go into work and then I got to talk to these assholes. And they're like, uh, uh, my daughter's doing Girl Scout cookies. By the way, how about she just sells nine boxes of Girl Scout cookies? Does she have to sell 14 pallets of Girl Scout cookies? Do I have to get a flatbed with a Tommy lift on it so we can move more cookies for her? And then these assholes come into work and they go, my daughter's selling Girl Scout cookies. What, what can we put you down for? And I go, I don't know. Put me down for a box of Thin Mints. And they go, that's it? <laughs> and there's always some asshole in the office. Uh, Rick bought uh, two cases of Samoas. Okay, Rick's an asshole. <laughs> or he's a pedophile. I, I don't know. I bought a box. Is that not enough? <laughs> there should be no more parents doing bidding for the fucking kids. You sign up. When I, when I was a, a, at the East Valley Trojans, every year they'd give you a little box of chocolate. It was, a, it was a weird chocolate bar. It was like a brick. You know, it had like one almond in it. It was like foil, right? It was a little suitcase. And there were, 12 of them in there. They're like, they're a dollar a piece, you know? And they'd give those home. First off, I couldn't imagine going home and handing them to my dad. Go, hey, bitch, get out there. Go to the mall. Go sell that shit. I'm going to watch Johnny Quest. You come back and make it soon. Cash on the barrel head. My dad's like, I'm not even planning on giving you dinner tonight, okay? I don't even know what we're talking about with these candy bars. Well, and that's back in the day, for whatever reason, we, we had to sell trash, like boxes of trash bags, summer sausage, magazines, and they were like, and remember, the big winner gets, you know, two free coupons for a personal pan at Pizza Hut. And even then, I was like, but exact, where is this money going, and why is it only worth a $3 pizza? Where yeah. is this money going? I, I still have, like, PTSD. If anyone ever shows me the miniature manila envelope. Remember the miniature? Yes. By the way, they don't make a medium size. They make one that's this big, they make a two inch little manila, and they make the big one. But the little manila would come with the candy bars and they'd be like, oh, you take your money and you stuff it into the little manila thing and uh, then they pull it out when you check the candy bars in. Every single year it was the exact same thing. I'd give the case back the case had 12 candy bars on it, or in it when I got it. Now it's got one and a half because I couldn't, I, I, I was a junkie. I, like, I needed, I understand my mom is a fucking health food cunt, and I was trapped at home with a brick of candy bars. It'd be like if you just went to Andy Dick's house with a wheelbarrow of cocaine and went, hey, I need you to watch this for me. I'm going to come back in three weeks. I'm going to weigh it, okay? I need the exact oh, yeah. amount of cocaine that's in it now, all right? We already went and put it by the TV set. What are you watching? I'll just put it in front of the set. Now, don't get into that shit, Andy. Remember, I'm going to weigh it. I was a junkie. 
I was a candy. I was nuts. My mom had no candy, had no goddamn dessert in the house, had a bunch of, you know, my, they, there, there was sprouted this and whole wheat that and 17 grain bread. Everything was a goddamn shit show over there. And then they give me a brick of candy bars and I would just sit in my shit box house with no air conditioning and stare at the box of candy. And it would beckon me. It was like uh, Seymour from Little House of... Uh, what the fuck? Feed me. Feed me. Feed me. The box would start talking to me like the uh, hamburger helper glove. <laughs> hey, loser. Want some empty calories? I bet you do. I know you're miserable. Like you know what would heal the pain? Me climbing inside your tummy. <laughs> And then I would go eat the fucking bars. I would sell three of them. I would, yeah, when I turned the fucking thing in, I could remember be like one of the responsible moms of the East Valley Trojans because they were all responsible. The moms who showed up and did all the drives, they were like the responsible moms, the moms who cut up the oranges for halftime, the ones that volunteered to work the concession stand, Mrs. Whitman, she had her hair done. My mom was locked in her room yelling freak out the whole time and consulting her biorhythm wheel. And then I'd show up and Mrs. Gallagher would be there and she was like put together and had like lipstick on. And then she'd go, well, turning the candy bars in. She'd go, okay, what do we have here? Well, there was 12. Now there's one and a half. Uh, what's in the miniature envelope? And I'd go, oh, I, I think it's all there. And she'd open it up, and uh, $3 and a moth would come out. And she'd be like, well, a spent condom, you know. She'd be like, there's one and a half, and this is three. We gave you, it's a dollar a bar. I'd go, I know, I'm fucking pathetic. I'm a junkie. Sorry, what were we talking about, Gina? <laughs> well, you know, the more you, the more you launch into the story, the more I realize this is pimping and this is child exploitation and sure. possibly trafficking because yes. they have to go to door to door. Agreed. Thank you. All right, let's do one more, Gina, and then we'll uh, pull our ball puller up here. You got it. A new survey found that, oh, Adam, these are your people, that 20% of respondents said they would consider planning when their child was born to make sure it's a certain zodiac sign. <laughs> Millennials, in particular, are concerned with their baby's sign, followed by Gen Z, who are concerned about their future baby's zodiac sign. In regards to which signs are particularly popular, the people said if they could choose, they'd go with Scorpio, Aquarius, or Taurus and plan their... Uh, plan their birth around those signs. All right. You know what someone needs to do? I don't know if somebody has... Is, is, uh, has anyone ever put this Zodiac poster together where they just go, it'd just be easy. We take all the Zodiac signs and we go, Virgo, Hitler. And then we go, <laughs> Pisces, Idi Amin. And uh, we go, uh, Sagittarius, um, Janine Garofalo. You know, we pick all the fucking worst people on the planet. And we go all the way through the signs. And we put all the horrible people throughout history. And then we go, which one is this important? Which one do you really need your kid to be? This is junk science, people. Until... Somebody gets out the paper and starts reading your astrological sign, in which case you become all ears. All I do is make fun of people, but the second someone pulls the thing out and tells me what kind of month I'm supposed to have, I'm all fucking ears because I'm a narcissist. There's a website called astroreligion.com that lists the worst person in history to be associated with your uh, your sign. Oh, good. Give it to us. Uh, Virgo, my sign, Genghis Khan, not, not a good guy. Uh, Leo, oh, uh, Mussolini, yeah, bad times. Yeah. Uh, so it's that. Yeah, yeah, it's Astro Religion, yeah. Oh, David Berkowitz was a Gemini. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> so there you go. Go to that website and... Uh, and by the way, how do these people, they just do the nine-month math? I mean, they... Yeah, yeah. They, 
And you, yeah, you back out nine months. Bad news for Taurus is oh. Tori, uh, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, and the Ayatollah Khomeini. No! Yeah. <laughs> My sister's a Taurus. I knew it. I knew it. There's something I never trusted about that bitch. I knew well, it. And the good news is um, nobody who was born after 1990 has ever been picked up in a bar with somebody asking what their sign is. That's a very good point. And really, I feel, maybe this is a 70s reference, but whatever sign makes the best medallion, that's the one you should be shooting for. All right, Gina, let's bring it home, little girl. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. All right, you guys, uh, say goodbye to Paul Brian and Gina Grad over there. Hey, Geico, do you own? Do you rent? Well, you do one or the other, right? You know, it's hard work out there. Owning, renting. You want to save some money? How about your bundle? Bundle your policies at Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle the homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you got so much to do already. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, see just how much you could save at Geico. That is Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Uh, we should bring Steve, our uh, NASA scientist, uh, up here. Steve. Steve. Yes. Hi, Steve. Steve is uh, making his way to the stage. You guys have all written one word on a ping pong ball, and we shall uh, have Steve pull those uh, bad boys out. And uh, we will do a riff on the, uh, on the ball. I hope I get recumbent bike or Girl Scout cookies, because I got a lot of preloaded material for those. How are you, Steve? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll heat that mic up a little bit for you. Feeling okay. good? Sure. Feeling good? Can we, hear, can we hear Steve okay? Yeah, we got you. Breaker 1-9? Yeah, okay. NASA scientist. Worked on uh, many different projects for NASA? Correct, yes. Is that... uh, Now, did you always want to do that? Did you want to be an astronaut? Was there some part of NASA that you wanted to be in and you ended up uh, a scientist? Did you want to be a fighter pilot? What were the thoughts? Well, basically, when I was a kid, I used to make model rockets, so I was sort of a born nerd. So it was the only choice I had. I don't, uh, the kids don't do models anymore. Models were like a big deal when I was a kid. That was like, you'd get your model, you'd build your spaceship, you'd build, you build your rocket ship, you'd build a, uh, a battleship, you'd build all this great stuff. There is no more, no more modeling. And my uh, son's never going to experience the simple pleasure of huffing glue. <laughs> Because that was a residual perk to building models. Uh, so, Steve, you retired? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and now, for uh, a hobby, you do what? Yeah, live, just live in Colorado, you know. Go just out live. hiking and mountain biking and all that sort of stuff. But you enjoy Colorado? You hike? You do outdoor oh, yeah, absolutely. stuff? absolutely, yes. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's, get, let's make it be with the balls. You turn that thing around, let's we'll see which one. Yeah, do it medium slow. I think, the, I think when you go fast, it seems to be an, an issue. All right, there you go. Hey, I, think, yeah, I think it'll just fall out if you uh, just let it go down. There you go. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Or you spin it. What do you do? You spin it clockwise, then go counterclockwise? All right. Peaches. Peaches. All right. We got a we got a nectarine crowd here. <laughs> Fuck peaches. Peaches. I like peaches, but something happened to peaches. Peaches went south at some point. I don't know. Peaches were a very happy part of my childhood. I loved peaches when I was a kid, and when I was a kid, 
all peaches were good. My batting average with peaches these days are dreadfully low. A lot of mealy peaches. Also, I was trying to eat a peach the other day, and I thought to myself, I'm going to remove this sticker that's on top of the peach. Now, listen. Do we have to fucking put more stickers in a fucking drag boat on every goddamn thing that goes into our kitchen these days? Think about it. I mean, there used to just be stickers were on the oranges, and then they got on the lemons, and then they got on the avocados, and they started with the bananas. Fine. You may put a sticker on something that has a skin on it that I'm going to remove, but you cannot put a fucking sticker on a tomato or a peach because I'm going to eat that shit. I am convinced. 30 years from now, half this room's going to be in the hospital with severe, severe abdominal pain and surgeons are going to be removing nine pound balls of stickers from our colon. There's two syndromes Two out of three Americans are going to suffer with a year from now. It's going to be sticker gut. It's going to be the accumulation of eating all the stickers that were on all the peaches and all the nectarines and all the tomatoes and something I call floating liver, which is a syndrome which is caused by you chugging too much water at the airport security line. We all do that thing where it's like, this thing was seven bucks, and now I got to throw it in the garbage. Fuck it. I'm pouring it over my head like I finished a marathon. The peaches have gone mealy. And in a weird way, it's a metaphor for this country, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll tell you why. When I was a kid... Peaches didn't look good. They were good. Now they're all roided up, full of creatine, spent too much time in the tanning salon. Oh, the peaches are beautiful looking, but inside is a mealy, rotten core, just like the youth of this country. And then there's plums. I have no thoughts about plums, but I look at the plum as the poor man's nectarine. If you like a plum over a nectarine, I got no fucking time for you. As a matter of fact, I think we're doing a meet and greet or something after this. If you like plums better than nectarines, don't don't bother. Just stay here. I don't want to see you. You disgust me. Although... The plum has the best pit. It's a good pit to suck on for a while because it's got a bunch of pubes you can't get off. The nectarine pit just looks like a monkey brain and all the weird strands come off it. But the peat, the, the, uh, the plum does not want to die. You pull it apart, you eat it as much as you can, but it still gets those weird little puby strands attached to it, and you must suck on that thing until it's dry. The mango. Mango, man. That's a tough pit to suck on, that mango. I'm dying for some goddamn fruit salad about now. I've got to be honest with you. Let me tell you this. I used to argue with uh, Dave Damashek over which was the best fruit. And that asswipe would say to me, oh, the number one fruit of the decade is the apple. And I'd go, no way, no way. There's no way. Apple's not number one. There's so many. Uh, first off, you, you, got, uh, you got cherries. Forget about Bing cherries. You got the... Uh, Rainier. You got the Rainier cherries. Oh, the best. Whatever. But I said, look, here is the best fruit. Let me tell you what the best goddamn fruit is. You can figure out the best fruit. Next time you order breakfast and they give you the option of getting the fruit bowl with the, with the hash browns and the Denver omelet. See the way I'm keeping it local here? You get that, get that fruit bowl 
And what I said to Dave Damashek is, how come then, if apple is the best fruit, how come every time someone eats a fruit bowl, the last piece of fruit in the goddamn bowl is an apple? How come? <laughs> you think it's because we have such great discipline, we're saving the best one for last? No fucking way. The pears go before the apples. The fruit bowl, it goes pineapple, you hit that first. That's the first one to go from the fruit bowl. Then the strawberry. The blueberry, you would like to eat earlier, but it's too goddamn small and you can't get your fork into it, so that'll have to wait. You go pineapple first, then we go strawberry, then we go any kind of melon, then we scrape the blueberry, we try to, ho- you try to corral it. You gotta get a, you gotta get a little uh, a shepherd in there to get that blueberry in your mouth. And then, if time permits, and you're bored, and you're not full, you will eat the miniature slice of shitty green apple at the end. Sorry. That's how you eat a fruit bowl. Thank you. Peaches. What else we got, Steve? So I think you go one direction, then you go the other direction. It'll, it'll, it'll spit the ball out. He's from NASA, I know. This is, this is where our taxpayers went to. This is where our taxpayer dollars went to this man. And he can't even read it. Let's see what it says. What does that say? It says... It's hieroglyphics. Fa- oh, P-H... Fa- f- fellow... Philo, philology? Felonology? <laughs> Philo, I don't know that word. All right. I don't know Greek or gay. So, <laughs> new ball. We got a new ball. It. We have to new ball it by law. Jets, like New York Jets. Jets. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Hold on a second, Steve. I'll decide what kind of jets. <laughs> the jets. I'm not going to get into the New York jets. Those guys suck. And even though I live close to jet propulsion laboratories in the Pasadena area, I'm not going to focus on those kind of jets either. I am going to focus on the gang that jets from West Side Story. The sharks would go up against the jets, right? The jets and the sharks, and they were snapping their fingers, and they had a bandana. You pull that... Here's the whole thing. Let me tell you about bandanas. You pull the bandana down low, you're a badass. You pull it up. You're into hiking, and you put it in your back pocket. That makes you a bottom. And just saying, you, ch- you tie it around your thigh, you're chachi. It's a lot of range, like for bandanas. But the sharks and the jets, they were singing. They had stilettos. They would fight. They'd have uh, little turf wars. Oh, they would rumble. Those were the gangs of yore. Think about how quaint street gangs used to be in the 50s. We used to have gangs that sung and snapped their fingers in super aggressive ways. And every once in a while, the guy would pull the stiletto knife out and he'd go, come on! And then he'd throw it from one hand to the next hand, which I don't recommend with any kind of knife, even if you're just in the kitchen. Please, keep that knife in one hand, kids. But... Now, our gang's 2021. It's like, oh, we have MS-13. Well, what do they do? Oh, they behead 13-year-old girls. Like, what the hell? I miss the 50s gangs where they snapped their fingers and they sang. I don't like the new gangs that are into human trafficking and cooking bathtub fentanyl and stringing out minors and shiving kids on their way home from school and uh, smuggling kids over the border. By the way, I'm so naive, I forgot what those coyote gang guys do. The coyote gangs are like the Medellin cartel guys, and I'm so fucking naive. I'd hear these stories where they'd be like, uh, 
Well, a Chevy Suburban got into an accident and 128 people died. I was like, whoa, man. Were they going to camp? Well, how did all those kids? By the way, you got to say this about those gangs. I'm moving on from the Jets to the Medellin cartel gang, but... These are super crafty individuals, you know what I mean? Like, you figure out... Look, let's give the cartels their due. (laughs) They have figured out on their own how to build a submarine and use it in the ocean. They have figured out how to get 125 people into a car that holds seven. These are insanely crafty people. Our super scientists here can't even get a fucking ping pong ball out of a hopper. These guys are building submarines. These guys figure out a way to tunnel two miles in the desert. These guys figure out a way to launch people over fences. I mean, these are amongst the craftiest people. Later on, when we catch them and incarcerate them, they figure out how to make wine in a toilet in a a prison cell. These are super crafty people who just need a little focus. You know what I mean? Like, we need to steer them toward the the good, you know? Because they're they're hard-working chaps... That's for sure. They don't take weekends off. They're industrious. They're crafty. God knows they can handle an acetylene cutting torch. I mean, they build submarines and smuggle heroin in through the sea. I mean, I'm just saying we shouldn't, you know, send them over a fruit basket or anything, but uh, give give the cartels their due. What are we talking about, jets? <laughs> when is somebody going to build a fucking affordable jet? Shouldn't we have private, affordable jets by now? Honda makes one. You've seen that Honda jet? That's, uh, it's like carbon fiber. It looks pretty cool. It's, uh, it's got... It uh, it's basically doesn't have a lot of range. The range is... Where do you want to go? You tell them and they go, just about a mile short of where you want to go. That's how the Honda jet works. It is, uh, I think it's like seven million bucks or three million bucks or whatever it is. And you know, the big thing with jets is you never buy a used jet. Uh, Oh, you always buy a used jet. You don't buy new, you you buy previously owned. Although, yeah, I would say if I was selling jets, I wouldn't use the word used. I would say previously owned. You sounds like it might fall out of the sky. <laughs> All right, let's pull another one. Here we go, Steve. Where do you live, Steve? Go, Steve. 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 Go, Steve. There you go. Yeah, Steve got it. Gefilte the fish. Gefilte the fish. Gefilte the fish. I don't know what it is with the Jews. The Jews... I've thought about this a lot. I had a Jewish grandfather. He liked gefilte the fish. He liked beef tongue. You guys like uh, bitter herbs and roasted eggs. You like matzah. You, you really... Matzah is essentially all the carbs of bread with none of the joy. There's nothing better. You know what the... uh, Oh, you can tell the difference between uh, the Jews and the French simply by examining matzah versus croissant. The croissant is nothing but fluff and puff and air, and it's a joie de vivre. Enjoy your life with this beautiful, puffy pastry. And And the Jews are like... You should cut the soft palate of the top of your mouth with this unleavened, unleavened piece of salty shit. But you can't tell if it's stale or not because it's always stale. It's stale out of the box. 
You Jews. You Colorado Jews. Gefilte fish is horrible because it's basically like if you took Jello and if there, if there was a flavor of Jello called rancid cod, that's essentially what gefilte fish tastes like. But here's my thing. Jews eat crazy bad stuff. Like, you're not a Jew, right? You've never had gefilte fish. No, you wouldn't. Why would you? Why would anybody? And it's always like, it's, it's always during the celebration. Like, oh, we, uh, we, eat the, we eat the bitter herbs and the roasted egg and the gefilte fish to uh, celebrate the misery of our forefathers. I'll tell you, who would never do this? The Mexicans. The Mexicans are like, oh, yeah, make the chimichurri sauce and cool the Corona and we're going to make some flap steak and later on we hollowed out a paper mache donkey and we're going to fill it full of candy and beat the shit out of it with a mop handle. Those fucking people don't mess around. They don't punish themselves. They don't leave a chair open for Jose. They don't do any of that. They get to fucking party. Now, here's the thing about the Jews. The Jews are a very meek and mild-mannered people. They do not take a lot of chances. You've never seen... You never heard anyone say, Hey, did you see the Jewish guy crushing it on the freestyle of the X Games on the snowmobile competition? You didn't see Herschel? Oh, the guy did a fucking full Superman on a, on a snowmobile. The Jews, they don't engage in any risky behavior, but they eat like fucking evil can evil. They become stunt people when it becomes eating. They eat shit Travis Pastrana would never let in his house. They go out and buy it and devour it. So, gefilte fish. And also, I would be mad. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever give this any thought, but if I was an animal and someone caught me and gutted me and was going to consume me, I would want to go out on top. You know what I mean? Like, I would like to be nice piece of swordfish on a mesquite grill or a piece of salmon that some guy was cooking over an open flame after plucking me out of a river. I wouldn't want to be a gefilte fish. That would just be, oh, you gave your life so some fucking rabbi could mash it into his mouth and half of it on his beard? And then belch you up 45 minutes later? Poor gefilte fish. You guys got phones out there, right? What is, is a gefilte fish, is that cod? White fish. It's white fish, but is white fish, is white fish a type of fish or is it like white people? We had Irish... We got Italian. We're all honkies. It's unfair to put us into one group. Uh, all right, let's do, let's do one more. Yeah, Steve's got it. One of your favorite words, succulent. 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 Wow, this is a fucking uh, heady crowd. Or everyone works at a Sprouts? What's going on? People here work at nurseries. You understand, I travel the country and I do this, and most of those ping pong balls are like, douche fuck N word. They're not succulent and peaches and jet. This is the fucking headiest, tamest crowd. I've, I've ever I've ever seen it's it's all scatological, dooky, felchy, thumb in the assy. It's, it's a mess. Those balls are a mess. 
You guys are... You guys are uh, well, uh, well healed over here. All right, succulent. Succulent is a variety of plant that does uh, well in uh, warm, uh, in, in warm climates. Yeah, that's what I have. All right, okay, all right, all right. So what I do, my whole thing. Here's my thing with plants. All right. I live in California. It's hot. It's dry. It's arid. It's desert. It, you know, it's ninety-seven degrees. I have properties. I have some warehouses and a house, and and I always plant the succulents. You 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 tear up. You you go down to the planter. You pull all the shit up. You put down. You got to put down the cloth first so the weeds don't pop through. Then you go down to the Home Depot. You buy a plant. You don't have to do any drip irrigation. You don't have to hose it. You don't have to do anything. You get the right goddamn plant for the right climate, and it shall flourish. Put some rocks down. Walk away. Looks amazing. And when you travel, as you guys heard this jag before, when you travel to places like Vegas and Phoenix and stuff, that's how they do their landscaping. When you're riding along the freeway, you see the succulents, you see the fucking uh, gravel they've laid down. They, it works because that's the climate it's in. In California, we will not accept that we live in a dry desert, and so we try to plant it like it's a fucking golf course in <laughs> in Tampa and it's not and it never works and all we get is weeds and I was walking by the goddamn side of the freeway today because every single day I have to torture myself. I walk I have two warehouses one where there's a studio where we do the podcast, the other's where the cars are and and where the cars are and where we do all our movie making and I walk from one to the other but I go the roundabout way, which takes me by the freeway so I can look up at the side of the hill where the weeds are growing on the dirt because they cannot wrap their head around the fact that we should be planting succulents there and not trying to get grass to grow where it's not. And I will give you a metaphor. Here's the thing. You have to take the fucking hand that's dealt to you. If you live in Maui, but then by all means, plant the fucking palm trees and the birds of paradise. But when you live in Los Angeles, you got to lay down the fucking ice plant and call it a goddamn day. Because that's what Mother Nature dealt you. And I'll give you a metaphor. When you try to get nature to do something it doesn't want to do, then you get COVID-19. That's what happens when you fuck with nature. You fuck with nature, you're going to kill her virus. And I'll give, you a, I'll give you a perfect example. When I was in junior high, I was in junior high from like 1976 77 and 78. All right. Now, wh- why is that significant? Because those were the most important three hair years this country has ever experienced. Oh, there was Farrah Fawcett. She had the big thing with the feathered hair. There was Leif Garrett. There was Keith Partridge. It was all big feathered hair. In the mid-70s, you had to have big feathered hair. There's no more hair rules anymore. You got this guy, he's a fucking cue ball, but he's crushing it. You got this guy, he's got his hair short. This guy's got his ponytail. Steve over here is rocking the, the, the mid length. There are no more rules. You wear, but here's the point. If, here's the point. When you try to get your hair to do something it doesn't want to do, you get COVID-19. Because back in the day, you couldn't just buzz it off. You had to have long, weird, feathered back hair. So if you were balding, you had to grow one side of your hair long and then flip it over to the other side of your hair because you couldn't let nature do its thing. You had to tamper. And when I was in junior high in like 1970, all right, buddy, here we go, Cuba. Bring it down. Got to bring it down. Got to bring it down. 
When I was in uh, Walter Reed Junior High in 1977 and everyone had the big feathered hair, I tried to get my hair to do what Farrah Fawcett's hair was doing. Now, do you know how that turned out? My fucking hair looked like Ron Jeremy's ass. I was trying to get my Brillo pad Jufro to do something God in nature wouldn't permit it to do. But I tried. And what I got was an unmitigated disaster. So, whether it's Adam Carolla trying to feather his hair in 1977, L.A., trying to grow grass and palm trees by the side of the freeway, or the fine people of Wuhan collecting bats and experimenting on them. Whenever you fuck with nature, you always get a shit show. Thank you very much for coming out here. Thanks to Steve, who came out here today. And until next time, Sam Crow for Steve and Paul Bryan and Gina Grad saying, Mahalo.